Uh, hi, good morning, and uh, thanks for being here so late in the conference. So yeah, this is joint work with uh, Wei from UCSD and Tung from Florida State. And this talk is about indistinguishability, and the starting point is the fact that proving indistinguishability is a central step in assessing the security of symmetric cryptography. And in fact, very often we end up with fairly sophisticated proofs which are made of complex and error-prone probabilistic argument, arguments. And for this reason, several frameworks have been developed uh, over the years to ease this task and make it easier for us. Still, there's a number of very hard technical questions that remain open and for which we have no solutions. And so the main purpose of this work was to come up with new techniques to enhance the set of results we can cover and for which we can prove indistinguishability. And in particular, we have two contributions. The first one is a new framework, which we call the chi-square method for indistinguishability proofs, which is then applied to a number of constructions that we analyze for which we obtain not only simpler proofs, but often tighter bounds. And for time reasons, in this talk, I'm going to focus of, on one of these constructions, which is the XOR of pseudo-random permutation. It's a very simple construction which has eluded a simple analysis for almost two decades uh, to date, and hence it's a great testbed for our framework. So for this reason, I want to start this talk by giving you an overview of this construction and the problem it solves because, before moving to our actual contributions. So the problem we are considering is the one of building good pseudo-random functions, or PRFs. So remember that this object is just a function which takes additional a secret key. And if this key is chosen randomly, no adversary, usually called a distinguisher, can tell apart an interaction with the keyed function from an interaction with a truly random function, which returns uniform random outputs. And this indistinguishability is formalized by having the distinguisher output a decision bit. And then we capture its distinguishing advantage, or PRF advantage, which is the difference between the probabilities that the distinguisher output one in each of the two experiments. And generally, we are interested in the best possible such advantage, given a certain distinguisher running time t and a budget of queries q. And we would like, of course, for f to be a good PRF, this to be as small as possible for t and q as large as possible. A related notion is that of a pseudo-random permutations, or PRP, and it's better tailored at block ciphers, like AES, so here, the context is that our function, our keyed function, is a permutation for each value of the key. So it's one to one and has no collisions in the outputs. So it's fair here to re only require indistinguishability from a random permutation, which returns outputs that are random but are however distinct. And of course, one can formalize this again in terms of corresponding PRP distinguishing advantage. So again, the, the important point here is that from a practical standpoint, what we want are good PRFs. Because these are great tools that allow us to achieve a lot of applications for encryption and authentication and so on. But what we typically have are good PRPs in the form of block ciphers like AES that are, satisfied, that are assumed to satisfy this property in a strong sense. And the catch with it is that a block cipher can never be a good PRF if the number of queries exceed the square root of the domain size. And this is just by the birthday bound. Beyond the number of queries, you will notice the lack of collisions, and hence you can distinguish from a random function. So it's totally conceivable to have regimes for adversarial complexity where AES is a good PRP, however it's a completely insecure PRF. So a question that was asked for the first time by two uh, very close works, time close, timely close works by Bellare, Krovetz, and Rogaway, and Hal Wagner, Kelsey, and Schneier in 98, is whether one can find transformations that transform PRPs into PRFs while preserving security. And a very neat construction that was first suggested by Bellare et al. in their paper without a proof is the XOR of PRPs. So the idea here is that we obtain a PRF, which depends on the, the key of the PRF are two block cipher keys. And to evaluate it on input X, we evaluate the block cipher on the two keys on the same input X and XOR the outputs. I refer to this construction in the following as XOR2 because of its two key nature. You can easily obtain a one key version of this construction by losing one bit of input length and prepending a zero or a one to the input and invoking the block cipher on, the same on these two inputs and XORing the output. Uh, we'll call this one the XOR construction. Now, this, studying these constructions is far from just purely theoretical interest. So there are practical schemes that are meant to achieve beyond birthday secure security that rely on it. And in fact, very recently, Ivata and Soren have proposed a modification of the GCM SIV authentication encryption scheme that uh, relies on the construction for more secure key derivation from nonces. 
So it's important for this reason to have good bounds on the PRF security of the XOR2 and the XOR construction. And the way we approach uh, proving something like this, a bound on the PRF security, is typically by transitioning to a simpler to handle intermediate world where we replace the block cipher instances with independent randomly chosen permutations. It's easy to bound the distance between the two left worlds just by the PRP advantage of the underlying block cipher, which is usually very small. And then the problem is to find a bound uh, disting for distinguishing the two right-hand side worlds. And combining the two bounds, we can get a bound for the PRF security. And so we typically focus on upper bounding this term, which is the really hard problem, where we have this idealized version of the XOR2 construction, or respectively the XOR construction. And giving such bounds typically is a purely information theoretic problem. We don't really know how to exploit uh, computational bounds on the power of the distinguisher. We typically only exploit the number of queries it makes. So there has been work uh, and technically very involved work on analyzing this quantity and analyzing these constructions. The first such result was by Bellare in Pagliazzo, who published in 1999 uh, uh, an unpublished manuscript that gave a bound that essentially implies security up to almost two to the n queries. Unfortunately, this paper has some minor errors that by now we know how to fix, but remain unpublished. And Lux, one year later, published actually a bound which is inferior for the extra and extra for the two key version of the construction and only guarantees security up to two to the n over three queries. So it was up to only until 2008 and 2010 that Pateran published two analyses of uh, the two variants of the construction which essentially give optimal security or near optimal security. And in this work we actually give very similar bounds to Pateran's. And the point however and why this is important is because Pateran's bounds follow by applying a very heavy hammer that Bart is going to talk about in his talk later on called mirror theory. And the other results are proofs that are very involved. They, go, they exceed 50 pages in length. And uh, I think at least the second one is probably not yet published and not fully verified to date. So in contrast, our proof follows as a much simpler application of our chi-square method. And while for the one key version, we pretty much match and get a only slightly weaker bound than Pateran's, which is tight, uh, for the two-key version, we get a much superior bound where we have an exponent higher than one, which gives us, of course, much smaller advantage for uh, query regimes that are smaller than two to the n. So I want to give you an overview now how the chi-square method works and what it does. And to do so, we have to look at the general problem of a distinguisher that attempts to tell apart two interactive objects or systems, f and g, by making queries to them. And we want to upper bound its distinguishing advantage in doing so. Now, it is convenient to look more closely at how an interaction between the distinguisher and the system looks like. So the distinguisher will proceed by making queries and receiving corresponding answers from the system F and make a certain bounded number of them, say Q, before outputting its decision bit. Now, a neat thing is that for information theoretic analysis, we can usually assume that the distinguisher is without loss of generality deterministic, meaning it doesn't make any random choices. And this allows us to describe the interaction uniquely by just looking at the answers of the queries. Because if the distinguisher is deterministic, you can reconstruct the queries themselves uniquely from their answers. Okay? They're always uniquely determined. So I'm going to denote the sequence of outputs obtained from the system by the distinguished D, which we now fix as the transcript Y superscript F. Of course, you can do the same for the system G, and you're going to obtain a corresponding transcript as uh, Y superscript G. Now, here is the point why we want to look at transcripts. So what we know from previous works already is a simple observation, is that if you want to upper bound the distinguishing advantage of D, you can do so by the statistical distance of the transcripts. In fact, this bound is tight if the distinguisher chooses its bit optimally. And so here, statistical distance is just one half the L1 distance between the probability distributions. And this observation has been exploited in numerous frameworks for indistinguishability proofs, in particular in the H coefficient method. Here, however, we focus on a specific class of proofs, which I call next output indistinguishability proofs. So what that means is that we consider settings where the distinguisher has performed a partial interaction, say with the system F, as observe y minus i outputs, your y will be equal 3. And now, given this observation, there is a well-defined probability distribution for the i output, the output to the i query. And we want to compare this next output probability distribution 
with the one we will get if we were actually interacting with the system G and we had seen the same partial set of outputs so far. And by comparing, typically, we will try, for example, to understand and upper bound the statistical distance between these next output distributions. If you can do that, then every cryptographer will probably almost instantaneously then try to apply a hybrid argument to upper bound the overall statistical distance by uh, summing up these next output statistical distances. So this is more of a probabilistic version of how you will state a hybrid argument. You have to be careful. These next output uh, distances depend on the sequence of previous outputs, so they are random variables. And therefore, you will need to take an expectation here when you're summing up. But it's really the usual hybrid argument. And one of the problems with this is that these hybrid arguments are known not to be tight in general. And for this reason here, we suggest a different approach, which is inspired by similar phenomena that have been observed in statistics, where instead of upper bounding the next output uh, statistical distances, we upper bound the chi-square divergence of the next output distributions. You don't need to understand chi-square divergence in detail beyond the fact that it's some sort of weighted version of L2 distance, which is asymmetric because the weights depend on one of the two probability distributions. But the key point is that when you do that, we can actually give an alternative version of the hybrid argument, which is what we refer to as the chi-square method, which essentially upper bound the statistical distance with the square root of the sum of the expected chi-square divergences over the number of queries. So it's very similar, but you have a square root. Now, of course, I might be cheating you here. I mean, this is just a different formula. You don't have any sense how statistical distance relates to chi-square. You know, are we getting anything new? And I want to give you one abstract example before turning to a more concrete one. Assume, for example, that we can show that the next output probability distributions are very close in a pointwise sense. For example, for every y, for every partial sequence of outputs, you know that the probability that the next output in y and the ratio between the probability that the next output is y in f and the probability that the next output is y in g is very close to 1. It's within epsilon in ratio. Now, if we do the standard hybrid argument and you want to compute the statistical distance between uh, the next output distributions, given this information only, you have to trust me. It's a very simple calculation. All you get is an upper bound of epsilon over 2. Put this into the hybrid argument. You're going to get something that grows linearly in the number of queries once you fix, fix epsilon. If you actually apply the chi-square method, then if you compute the chi-square divergence given the same information, again, little calculation, you have to trust me here, you get epsilon square as an upper bound, much smaller. And if you apply the refined hybrid arguments, now you get something which grows with the square root of q rather than q. As q gets large, this is a huge improvement. Now, I want to show you more concretely how this uh, chi-square method applies to analyzing the XOR construction. In particular, I want to look at the XOR2 construction. Again, it's easier to analyze. In the paper, we also have an analysis for the single key version, as I will say shortly. And what that means is that we are considering now our real system to be the construction instantiated with two independent random permutations, whereas our system G is going to be the truly random function. Now, if we want to apply the method, what we need to do now is try to understand this next output probability distributions. So we imagine that we run the execution for a while. There's some fixed distinguish distinguisher. It's implicit here, making some queries. It has made i minus 1 queries. And we have obtained, I we have obtained the first i minus 1 outputs. This is this bold face y i minus 1 vector. And now we want to understand what's the probability that the output to the next query, the i query, here again i is equal 4, equals small y. Of course, this is a complicated distribution we will need to understand, but the distribution is easy to understand in the case we were actually interacting with a random function. There, the probability will be uniform, so it's 1 over 2 to the n. So this allows us at least to put into place a formula for the chi-square divergence we are going to upper bound for every i. And our goal is to bound its expectation. And we can, in fact, here nicely exploit the linearity of expectation. And the problem is equivalent to upper bounding the individual summons in the sum over all outputs y. So we can fix an output y, any possible string, and upper bound that term for any y. So an important point here, again, I want to stress it again, this probability is quite hard to understand. And it's the core of the proof. But a neat observation that was already pointed out in the work by Bellard and Pagliazzo is that it's easier to deal with this probability 
If rather than conditioning on the sequence of i minus 1 outputs, which implies a lot of different things, we rather think of conditioning on the internal values that have been output by the two permutations. Call them ui to ui minus 1 and v1 to v y minus 1. If you actually condition on those, then it turns out that it's much easier to describe the probability that we reach a particular output. It's not clear you can do that, in fact, but a simple application of Jensen's inequality tells you that if you're actually computing the expectation only of these summons, we can do this by just not making the term smaller, and we will be able to upper bound the right-hand side, again, with something small. In fact, there's a spinor error here that was pointed out by Nandi and his student in the version we have in the proceedings. So we are updating this in, 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 on ePrint, where we are say, claiming that these are equal. They are not. But you can prove easily this with Jensen's inequality. And so we are left with the problem of uh, upper bounding this probability, really, and understanding it to upper bound the term. It turns out at this point, this is not very hard. In fact, all we need to do is we fix some values of so we fix the values of the permutation output, and we want to understand what's the probability that the i query takes the value y. And in fact, to do this, it's really enough to think how many possible values the i output of the first permutation, call it ui, can take which are consistent with the output still possibly being this fixed y. Remember, we fixed y. And we can do that. So in particular, if you look at the space of all possible 2 to the n values, we see that ui can definitely not be equal u1 to ui minus 1, because it's a permutation. So the i output of the permutation needs to be distinct. Also, you have to be careful that there are some other values it cannot take, because the value vi, such that ui x or vi equal y, is uniquely determined. And you need to make sure that this is also consistent with the fact that pi 2 is a permutation. So there is a set of other values that ui cannot take. Okay? Otherwise, you will never reach y, guaranteed. And so these are all of them, the two sets. These are the ones you can't have. Everything else is fine. And if we denote the, intersect, the size of the intersection of these two sets by diy, then it turns out you can use inclusion exclusion and give a very simple formula that you don't need to parse. Uh, of the probability that the value y is taken condition on the internal values and internal outputs of the permutation. So the key point here is that you have to trust me, but these are all simple calculations. And if you plug this in through some simple uh, algebraic manipulations and some inequalities and some working around them, you can upper bound the statistical distance with an expression which is the square root of a double sum of variances of these random variables diy that I just defined. Where again, remember that these are nothing but random variables obtained by sampling twice independently i minus 1 mb strings without replacement, and then shifting them by y, one, one of the two set by y, and looking at the size of the intersection. In fact, it's not hard to see that y does not even matter once you do that. And you can really set y to 0. Again, this is not a hard calculation. You have to work a little bit, but something you could ask in a probability class, you can upper bound the variance. And you plug them in, and you get the desired bound. I mean, the key point here is that I omitted a lot of calculations. But I really want to stress that the actual steps on the proof I haven't cheated are exactly what I wrote here, plus some calculations that require some pain, but can be done pretty easily. And if you compare it with existing proofs, that's a massive improvement. Now, going towards conclusions, there are more results uh, we present in the paper. So we, as promised, we analyze the single key XOR construction. Here, the analysis is more painful, uh, in particular because you have to deal with the fact that there's dependence uh, between, you don't have two independent permutations, so there's a higher degree of dependence. And this makes probability calculation somewhat more painful. But the high level structure of the proof is very similar to what I have just shown you. Okay? The bound is weaker. And the main reason for this is actually not even due to our technique, but simply the fact that this is a construction that can never output 0. And therefore, this makes the bound q over 2 to the n tight. Um, another construction that we analyze in our work is the encrypted Davis-Meyer construction that was proposed by Cogliatti and Soren here at Crypto last year. And they propose a bound up to 2 to the, n, 2 to the 2 n over 3 security. We improve this to the three quarter n security by using the chi square method. And here I have to say that I have to advertise that there's going to be a talk later in this session, which is going to go back to mirror theory to show a tighter bounds that implies security up to 2 to the n for the same construction. I also want to stress that it's not clear whether we can tighten our, our analysis using the chi square method, and it's still open and we might be able to do so. 
it's an open problem. And finally, we also study the swap or not cipher, which is a construction that was proposed by Hong, Morris, and Rogaway in the context of format preserving encryption. Here, the result is a bit harder to state compactly, but essentially, using the chi square method, we prove better trade offs between the, round, the number of rounds in the cipher and the achievable security level. So, I want to conclude with a big disclaimer here which is that the techniques that I have used here from a statistical viewpoint are really nothing new. So some of these techniques appear in previous works and also special cases of these techniques have used even in computer science. So a notable example is a paper by Kai Chung and Salil Vadan from 2008. They're both cryptographers, but the paper is not on cryptography. It's on, it's on analyzing hashing on block sources, which uses a special case of our framework in their analysis. There is even an older paper by Stam, not the cryptographer, a statistician, who actually proved something that rephrased in our own language using the chi-square method will directly imply good bounds for the truncated random permutations and giving bounds. But the, the methods were somewhat similar or special cases of what we have. But the bottom line here, and I think the lesson that we get out of this, at least with the example of the XOR of PRPs, is that when we have problems that are really technically hard, sometimes we are stuck on using frameworks that are well established to give these proofs. And in many cases, thinking a bit more broadly, like maybe people will do outside cryptography and statistics, using, for example, other metrics might help us solve the problem much more elegantly and uh, much more compactly and with better bounds. Also, not an entirely new uh, observation, even in this community, there's a notable example, a paper by John Steinberger from 2012, where he used Hellinger distance to prove bounds on key alternating cipher. So the fact that we can swap metrics in our type of proofs is also not something new. And there are open questions. As I mentioned before, uh, the encrypted Davis-Meyer construction, it would be nice to close the gap with a shorter proof using the chi-square method. Uh, another interesting question is on our two XOR analysis. I advertise the fact that having an exponent larger than one, of course, gives us better bounds and a better decay. But it's not clear that the 1.5 exponent is tight. And in fact, two might be more like a reasonable answer. I don't know, but we don't know how to prove it. And uh, of course, finding more applications is also something very important. OK, this is everything I wanted to say. So I thank you for your attention. The paper is on ePrint, and I'm happy to take your questions.